Have you ever played a game of Civilization, Kyle? An old one like Civ 2 and 3? Yes, uh, my first Civ game was actually Sid Meier's Civilization 3, actually. Oh, there you go. You know how sometimes you can go down really wonky paths in those games? You're sitting there in the year 2000, your army is still composed primarily of chivalric knights out there in the field, facing off against the encroaching panzer divisions of your neighbors. Yes, a bit of a... You decided to focus maybe a little bit too much on econ research. You have, you know, very nice roads and nice boats, but uh, lacking military equipment for the ground forces. <laughs> well, as it turns out, Star Wars is simply just a game of goddamn civilizations, as uh, the little stupid huts of our turtle people that we saw last episode turns out to actually be like wandering homes. Uh, apparently, they have mastered hover technology, capable of floating what seems to be pretty goddamn heavy little houses. I mean, they're armored enough to withstand blaster fire, so I presume them to be pretty, pretty hefty. And yet they're floating across the ground like it's nothing. And this isn't exactly the most flat terrain either. There's hills and hillocks and rocks all over the place, so this is some pretty fancy-ass tech we've got right here. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're no pushovers, actually. Well, uh, therein lies the problem, Kyle. Uh, they are, because... Technologically. Uh, <laughs> as, uh, as we started with the, uh, the question here, um, whilst the samurais, who also inhabit this, this world, for some unknown goddamn reason, they have developed laser weaponry and is capable of having blasters and shock spears and shit. Uh, whereas our little turtle people, the height of their offensive technology is a slingshot. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even damage them. It plinks harmlessly off their advanced armor, yeah, <laughs> armored helmet technology. See, I really hate this new galaxy because it's just the dumbest place ever. Like, where do these raiders get these blasters from, precisely? Where are their manufactorum complexes? They ride indigenous beasts' dogs. Like, where is this shit made? Did we just happen to dump down on the one piece of the planet where nothing is made? Is it a guild system? Where is the enormous walking home thingies, or f flying home thingies, produced? Is there, like, a BMW flying boxes are us manufacturers something or off screen? Is there a vibrant civilization of Japanese people preying on turtles that we simply haven't been shown yet? It's on the other side of the planet, Arch. As we all know, the galaxy is teeming with new surprises, and this new galaxy certainly defies all logic, doesn't it? Even when it comes to space and time. It shouldn't piss me off as much as it does, but it really but kind it of does! Uh, and it doesn't stop there either. This new galaxy, um, space travel works completely different in hyperspace as well. Ah, yes, that's true. So <laughs> To make it even worse. <laughs> Disney, of course, made a big song and dance out of um, Captain Diversity Hire, uh, killing the enormous, uh, totally not a Death Star 3.0, or 4.0, I think, at this point, frankly. Yeah, that point, yeah, 4.0. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, of, of the Imperials, by hyperspacing straight into it, which of course kind of screws over every single aspect of, you know, space warfare in this universe, but details, details. And today, the Pergils do the exact same thing. They end up in an enormous mild fi mi minefield, a minefield that's thrown, placed there, um, at some point, with some resources that he totally had aboard his, his one ship. Um, and yes, they just it's enormous, yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they just hyperspace out straight through the mines and everything, and they're not physical at all. They're just through. Yep, it, it just completely defies everything. So it's like, okay, so we've kind of won. We've gone around it again because that was a big minefield. And Arch ain't kidding when he mentions that it's big. Like, there's no way. Like, maybe the Star Destroyer had, you know, maybe a complement of thirty, maybe sixty mines. There are. Not hundreds, what looks to be thousands of these things, going all the way from the outer, <laughs> outer like uh, periphery of the planet, all the way to the planet. I do. The worst part is, as the Pergils warp out, they also detonate the mines, but take no damage. 
Wait, th this, this universe has no rules anymore. And to further emphasize that, you remember the derpy little MIG things that they, uh, they flow that fired at the uh. Jedi thingy ball but did absolutely no damage whatsoever? Yeah, they do a lot of damage now, don't they? Yeah, they're back, and this time their weapons do damage. Not only do the inside of the craft shake, but you can also see sparks and stuff appearing off the aircraft as it is hit. So, I guess physics and energy weaponry as well functions completely differently in this universe compared to the previous one. Yeah, everything, everything that you would expect to not work the way it works, works here, which is kind of weird. Uh, I really dislike this absolute, complete and utter thorough lack of it. Just, just basic, <laughs> basic internal consistency. <sighs> There's absolutely none of it today. Absolutely n oh, no internal and, okay. consistency. <laughs> Admiral Pancakes as well. So, Admiral Pancakes, Blueberry Pancakes, of course, is, <laughs> yeah. is reintroduced. And he is this galaxy-brained mastermind, you know, the throbbing brain of the operation. And he was like, oh, well, there, there seems to be people. My, my intergalactic radar tells me so. Let's put a minefield over there. Oh, clever. I don't know how you got it up there in time, mind you, but okay. A place minefield in front of enemy. That 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 is a strategic decision. You know, applause, totally good. Uh, he then proceeds to uh, carry out the the best best operation I've ever seen. So he he's got a brilliant ploy here. Uh, he knows that Ahsoka Tano is not heading for his ship. He says it. We are not the Jedi's concern because he knows Ahsoka is heading for uh, Ezra and. Uh, purple-haired woman, whose name I sp deliberately space on. And... Uh, don't you Sabine. dare. I got it. Don't you dare. I got it. <laughs> and so, knowing that Ahsoka is not heading towards him, knowing that Sabine and Ezra are driving shit-ass slow little hovermobiles miles away, days travel away, he regardless dispatches two groups of stormtroopers to be unilaterally slaughtered without inflicting any damage on the good guys, the Jedi's, or even the turtles, in fact. It's a it's a 100% one-way casualty generation machine. Uh, and yeah. then he pulls them back after having the majority of them get slaughtered, and he looks the woman in the face and goes like, <laughs> you know... All I see, Thrawn, is our enemies unified. And he goes, uh, well, you see, uh, once we distracted them by uh, killing our men upon their lightsabers, we almost finished loading our ship. But, but sir, we haven't finished loading our ship, sir, which means there's plenty of time for them to get on board still. Sir, not only are we not done loading, <laughs> but they weren't heading in our direction anyways. You seem to have achieved nothing but get our own people slaughtered, sir. Our best men wiped out. <laughs> yeah, Thrawn is kind of a dunderhead here, in a stunning classical Dave Filoni move, where Dave Filoni has masterfully, if you don't remember, uh, made had made General Grievous and Count Dooku, absolute monkeys in the Clone Wars show, has done a fantastic job of already putting his, his wonderful craft to work on Thrawn, as he makes him into the biggest dunderhood, dunderhead when it comes to his tactical and strategic level thinking, where he just makes the most... What, like asinine d decisions about his military forces. It's just stupid. <laughs> it serves it no is. purpose whatsoever. That was my like the best scene in the, today's episode is when the the witch confronts him. And was like, but like our enemies are now united and we've lost. He's like, but from my point of view, from my like, they're far away. From my and, perspective, and, they headed over there. And, you know, if they're, they're not here, then we're winning. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. He had another so really... brilliant statement as well earlier on when Ahsoka is hiding from his oh-so-effective starfighters. And he's like, okay, it's, it's a Jedi, Padawan of General Skywalker. Oh, well, he's a bound. But I know how to counter a Jedi. We'll let her do whatever she wants to do. Mm, yes, that way we'll always know what she's doing. Whatever she wants. And so we'll be ahead of her. Because she, we, we know that she'll fulfill her objectives. 
I'm clever. My brilliant strategy. I like how in every time they try to make him seem smart. It's like, oh, yes, my men are being slaughtered. And as they're being slaughtered, he's like, mm, this reminds me of the Jedi days. And so, Impressive. Ah, yes. They're beating my this ass almost as effectively as their, for their forefathers. Mm, <laughs> yes. Tasteful. Mm. I, I remember being in the Clone Wars, and I was on the Republic side, and it's so nice to be on the receiving end of the Jedi now. Mm, I can recall <laughs> getting my ass kicked in just this fashion previously. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a lot the win you'd think. It feels it a like Filoni is... He, he's, he's thinking, like, okay, Thrall needs to be a brilliant, dangerous tactician. Right, and so he's like, okay, he needs to be like real clever and smart and shit. But I, I can't let him win anything because, uh, well, my heroes are retards, and if I give them any setbacks whatsoever, we'll have to extend the series by another two episodes while they soul search. So, um, just make him sound smart, I guess, is what he said to the writers. <laughs> and he's like, okay, uh, so he's being super tactical. And Filoni's like, yeah, super tactical. And he's like, losing. It's like, perfect, perfect. Super tactical and losing horribly. <laughs> Why, come on, Californian writers. We need some examples of good strategy here. What have you got, Jim? Uh, he put a minefield uh, where he uh, knew the enemy would come. Fucking brilliant. That has never been tried oh before. God. What a brilliant tactician right there. Truly, he's gonna he's an absolute threat to the galaxy. We're establishing this man's tactical genius. <laughs> and then watch him. Well, he'll reunite his enemies, but then it'll turn out that was all a Kekakudori, you see. Because now they're really far away from the Star Destroyer. Yeah, but Jim, they were heading there anyway. Yeah, but now it's part of a plan. Yeah, if he said it was part of his plan, that means he was smart and that he wanted this. And so, despite, you know, his forces being wiped out, this is actually a victory, uh, and it was meant to happen this way. Fantastic, oh, okay. Jim. <laughs> Fantastic You're going to get a salary Jim. increase from this. Brilliant. Fred, you're fired. <laughs> You'll need Jim now. See, this is exactly what I warned about in The Mandalorian. If they're going to reintroduce <laughs> Thrawn, he has to be a menace. He has to absolutely kick the shit out of the heroes at least once to establish his credentials. This is is not that in any way, shape, or form. There's also a, a weird scene where Titus Pullo looks over at his little blonde companion and goes like, you see that horde of enemies over there, including two Jedi. Yes, master? Go fight them with the savages we found on the planet. You're not gonna help me? No. No, my destiny leads away from the dying area. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that is actually what they say. Like, she turns to him and goes, "Like, you're not gonna help," and he goes, "Like, no." Why? <laughs> because it's his destiny's in the past, and the past means fighting Ahsoka. For some reason, his motivations are awful. His his entire reason is like. I am a nihilist. There, there's no reason to go on. Okay, then give up. He's like, no, I'm going to make sure that war happens. In order to break the cycle of war happening, I'm going to make sure a war happens this time. And because it happens again, because I made it happen, it's not going to be the cycle repeating. It'll be, it'll be me breaking the cycle. It's like, are you, are you, what kind of drugs are it'll you? It'll be answer? different this time. And he it's faces of us against Ahsoka, and they, they do a stalemate, but this time, of course, Ahsoka is prepared. She's got a plan. And so she has her droid carry out a danger-close, high-explosive missile strafing run on both of them. <laughs> which sounds like a brilliant idea, until you realize that Ahsoka is now standing within five feet of exploding fragmentation ordnance, but details, motherfucking details. And she simply runs off, and Balin... Being well within his ability to chase her, she doesn't have much of a lead on him. They're, they're riding the same stupid dogs. Just kind of looks at her and smiles like, Well played, well played. I have been thoroughly trunched in this engagement. Yes, Admiral Thrawn would have enjoyed the butt kicking I received today. Yes, I'm going to go wander away and be fat somewhere else. Just like, just like the heroes of old, they beat me too. Ah, oh, yes. You know, it maybe brings a little bit of hope back in my... Oh, is that my Padawan dying over there? Eh, whatever. I've already consigned her fate to death. 
as he wanders away from her. It's also thoroughly pointless. Oh, there's that one other scene where the stormtroopers arrive, right? And they have them encircled, and they're definitely able to kill them. And she's like, all right, they're like, wait, don't you want to take us as prisoners? She's like, no, fire. And he's like, wait, wait, don't shoot. And the stormtroopers listen to, to Ezra, and they stop. He's like, okay, he told us to wait, so we can't shoot. Yes. Despite being ordered to fire. They were sent there that specifically to kill the Jedi that they just surrounded. And now they're just like, well, he asked us to wait, though. Maybe we should chill for a bit. I mean, maybe he'll surrender. And then Soka shows up and saves them and kills like a million of them. So, <laughs> What a pointless scene. Oh, my God. And once again, the only people who are in any danger here are the villains. That's yes. the problem. That's true. Like the stormtroopers. Honestly, I thought more about the stormtroopers and their silly little goofy rags that they're wearing. And I was like, you know, like this is this is actually horrible. Like they're being sent in against like two Jedi and like a, a like a person a wearing armor that they can't even penetrate. Like what the hell? Like this is not good odds. And also, where were those gunships? Okay, because oh, we'll send dispatch two gunships in to deal with them and support the mercenaries. The gunships land and deploy the stormtroopers, and they never provide air support. My lord, what if we have the heavy gunships <laughs> stand off a safe, a safe distance and simply bombard the ever living shit out of the stationary objective in front of us? No, yeah, that's what they would expect to happen. But lord, well, it would, it would still be effective. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, my lord, do we need air support? No. We are. Our loyalty to the Empire is good enough. <laughs> Send in the stormtroopers. I wish to see them purged. I didn't like the fact that they wore goofy rags anyways. <laughs> that, that is such a good point, though. Because, again, trying to make Thrawn look intelligent, he goes like, Yes, deploy and counter encirclement tactic. Counter encirclement? What are we counter encircling? <laughs> You're not about. You are not about to be encircled by the stationary or op opposition force. That's not going to happen. Here. What you're meant to say, Thrawn, is deploy an encirclement tactic. Surround them, and I don't know. Maybe use the gunships to bombard them. But you know, you wouldn't want to do that. That'd be silly. Yeah, like seriously, there's so much wrong with this script where they actually just use the wrong terminology. Like nobody in the boardroom is like, yeah, counter encirclement because he's countering. The fact that they're in a circle, so they're countering the circle formation. It's like, all the turtle people aren't fighting. They're hiding. There's yes. two people fighting. That is it. That does not count. <laughs> they can't encircle you. You have, like, two dozens of stormtroopers. They're outnumbered by a large no large margin. And again, they could literally have just hovered at, like, 20 meters away. And then just moved in circles around them. And pew, 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 Let's see who lasts longest. Our energy cells or your armor plating. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah, honestly, I don't even know why they deployed the troops and had them go on the ground. And again, the dumbest idea. If his idea, if his grand plan was like, yes, let's delay the Jedi who isn't heading in my direction so they won't be heading in my direction for even longer. In which case, an extended siege is kind of exactly what you're looking for, my buddy. Yeah. Also, Star Destroyers have fighter and bomber wings. Just frigging bomb them. What are you going to do? They don't have air superiority. They literally don't. So why aren't we taking advantage? We have the air power here. Ugh. Where's the genius? He just doesn't. He, he just like forfeits the air. Thrawn. Yeah, I sent two fighters at the enemy. Like, okay. Thrawn's a <laughs> retard here. Simple as. That's all. My... <laughs> He's a Dave Filoni villain. He's a moron. <laughs> It is like the 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 greatest danger presented to our turtle people and allies here in this entire episode is this one moment where Ezra comes out of his little shell and turns to one of the turtle people who's standing in the doorway and goes like, <laughs> "Close the door and lock it." At which point we both point out that the giant hungry wolf is directly behind the turtle person. It's like, "You gonna lock me in here with him?" Yep. He's like, "That's a bit more dangerous for the turtle than it is for." Else. Like, fear not, little turtle friend. If we are in this besieged here, I will not starve. <laughs> Ooh, turtle soup. <laughs> Delectable. Yes, that I, I I honestly don't like, it. and the turtle aliens. They're just there for whimsical, like, relief. That's all they are. 
They're comical. Like that's that's what they are. They don't do anything remotely interesting. And this, oh, is this whole thing is just trash. Introducing them opens up nothing but plot holes. Oh yeah. Yes. Like, why is a society developed this way? Why are they completely useless? How did they get this advanced? They had not develop any way to defend themselves. Why are they pacifists on a planet where they're being hunted? Like, the thing is, pacifism doesn't just happen in a hostile environment. Writers need to understand that. Like, if somebody's trying to kill you, a pacifist, like, society is going to get you wiped out. You know, they're going to be ruins. There's going to be nothing left of them. <laughs> See... They would have been better off just reintroducing Thrawn. Never saying how it happened, he simply returned using his brilliance, and the New Republic was completely clueless, he came back, and by the time Ahsoka and anyone knows what the hell is happening, he's already won. And he gets to turn slowly towards the camera and go like, You danced exactly to my tune. Here, let me unveil my grand plan. And then he'll be like, Oh my god, he was a clever clog. This, this is not it. This, this is the, as you say, the deifilonification of Thrawn.